the polarizing microscope has now become of outstanding importance for the study and identification of those orientated structures which lend themselves to examination by polarized light. Here the terylene has been fully crystallized at a higher temperature. And between cross polars, the change of structure is fully visible. The spherulitic black crosses taking up a zigzag shape. When crystallized at a still higher temperature, the extension of the zigzag between crossed polars, the crystalline regions of uncrystallized amorphous material. This sequence illustrates particularly clearly the insight to be derived from the use of polarized light. Other transparent substances, such as this sample of sugar, are equally featureless in ordinary transmitted light. When rotated under polarized light, the directional nature of its structure becomes apparent. As a simple biological example, these leaf scales are almost invisible. But under polarized light, their organized arrangement becomes visible. This projection microscope is particularly suited to the study of opaque objects. Here is an unetched sample of ingot tin viewed by ordinary incident illumination. It's almost featureless. Under polarized light, the grain boundaries are revealed by the selective reflection of the independent crystals. As another opaque example, the structure of this magnesium brick waste becomes more apparent when seen under polarized light. Having shown these general examples, the remainder of the film will be devoted to the study of small crystals, mainly mineral, which illustrate clearly the potentialities of polarized light, with brief reference to the underlying theory. Light, emitted by a source such as a lamp filament, originates from an enormous number of points vibrating in all directions. And from each point, light radiates in a succession of spherical waves which traverse the surrounding space. In the microscope, we are dealing with light at a considerable distance from the source. The light from any one point in the source has spread out, and many neighboring points are in the same phase of parallel vibration. These points lie in a nearly plane surface, which is called a wave front. The direction at right angles to the wave front is called the wave normal. In open space, or in glass, the light travels in the direction of the wave normal. A beam of ordinary light is composed of many such waves, which originate from all the points in the source. They are, consequently, vibrating in all possible planes. We cannot compel all the points in the source to vibrate in the same direction, but very efficient methods are now known for producing this result in the light as it enters the microscope. When all the points in a beam vibrate in one plane, the light is said to be plane polarized with that vibration direction. For many years, the chief polarizing device was the nickel prism made from a crystal of calcite. When ordinary light enters the calcite, it travels as two polarized beams which vibrate in directions at right angles to one another. One of them is reflected away to one side in the prism and lost. The other passes through the prism, which thus supplies plain polarized light. Nickel prisms are now being superseded by artificial polarizing filters, which are normally made in large flexible sheets and thereafter mounted between optical glass discs. It's rapidly taking the place of the narrow and expensive calcite prisms. A prism or filter used in this way to produce polarized light is called a polarizer. Two sheets of polarizing filter superimposed with their favorable directions parallel will transmit the full polarized beam. When turned through exactly 90 degrees, the light is extinguished. A second filter employed in this way is called an analyzer. To adapt a microscope for polarized light, we must provide a polarizer mounted below the stage 
and through which the light must pass before reaching the object. The mount can be rotated so as to vary the vibration direction of the light. For cook instruments, it's set to transmit light vibrating east-west. Another filter must be placed between the object and the eye to act as analyzer. It is set with its vibration direction at right angles to that of the polarizer, so as to extinguish the direct light. It's carried on a slide by which it can be removed from the tube when not required. Just below the analyzer, there are slots in the tube for the insertion of prepared crystal plates called compensators. The eyepiece is provided with cross lines which are parallel with the vibration directions of the polarizer and analyzer, that is, east-west and north-south. The Bertrand lens can be brought into the tube so that the image of the back aperture of the objective is formed in the eyepiece instead of the object. A graduated rotating stage must be fitted so that angular rotations of the object can be measured. First, we'll remove the polarizing equipment and use ordinary light. Here are two grains. One is glass, the other garnet. In air, they both appear rough and opaque. We'll surround them with oil, which has the same refractive index as the glass, which now becomes invisible. But the garnet still stands out because of its higher refractive index. Much may be learnt from the shape of the grains. They may be crushed fragments of glass, which are angular, or crystals, like this piece of carborundum grinding powder, or sand grains, which are worn and rounded. Crushed glass has a curved conchoidal fracture, but many crystals cleave easily along certain planes, the angles between which are characteristic and can be measured by means of the rotating stage. Gypsum forms flat lozenge shapes. The rock silicate kyanite cleaves into flat elongated plates bounded by two different cleavages nearly at right angles. Galena is opaque and breaks into cubic fragments, while calcite breaks into rhombohedra. Sometimes the grain is a complete minute crystal, bounded by straight edges whose arrangement indicates the crystal symmetry. Here is potash alum a group of parallel crystals, each of which is a combination of cube and octahedral forms. Sugar in flat oblong crystals. And potassium chromate in the form of orthorhombic crystals. Let us look again at a grain of glass in oil. With the condenser iris almost closed, its outline is stronger, and a bright line can be seen round the edge of the grains. This is called the Becky line and is very useful for determining the refractive index. If the objective is raised a little, the line moves onto whatever material has the higher index. Here it's on the oil. When the objective is lowered, the Becky line crosses the margin of the grain and appears on the material of lower index. The oil is therefore of higher index than the grain. Up to this point, we've not used the polarizing equipment. We'll now swing the polarizer into position. The field is now illuminated with light vibrating east and west. As regards their reaction to polarized light, transparent substances are divided into two classes, termed isotropic and anisotropic, or birefringent. Isotropic crystals do not vary in color or in refractive index, whatever may be the vibration direction of the light in the crystal. Ordinary glass, water and air are not crystals, but they also are isotropic. Here are isotropic fragments of fluor, spar, garnet and glass. They do not change as the stage is rotated. Now we'll test some anisotropic fragments in the same way. This is a prismatic crystal of the anisotropic mineral tourmaline. 
When it's pointing east-west, the polarized light is vibrating parallel to the prism. The crystal appears transparent. When it's turned north-south, the light is vibrating at right angles to the prism. The crystal is now nearly opaque. Evidently, the absorption of the light varies greatly according to the vibration direction. In white light, the two vibration directions may give rise to quite different colors. This property is called pleochroism. The behavior of light uh, in anisotropic substances can be explained as follows. In any section through a transparent anisotropic crystal, there are two principal directions at right angles, OH1 and OH2. These often coincide with the vibration directions for maximum and minimum absorption, like those that we've seen in a prism of tourmaline. When light vibrating along any direction, such as OP, enters the crystal with amplitude OP, it's resolved into two distinct polarized beams vibrating along the principal directions. One vibrates parallel with OH1, the other parallel with OH2. Their relative intensity depends upon the amplitudes, which are proportional to OH1 and OH2. As the crystal rotates, the amplitudes vary. OH1 diminishes, until when OH2 is parallel with OP, all the light vibrates in that direction, and there's no amplitude in the beam which was vibrating along OH1. In fact, all the light now passes straight through the crystal without changing its vibration direction. The two beams travel on inside the crystal with different velocities, and therefore have different refractive indices, N1 and N2. For this reason, anisotropic crystals are said to be birefringent. It's quite easy to detect the difference between the two refractive indices by using the Becky line method with polarized light. Here is our grain of tourmaline. It's mounted in a cement of refractive index intermediate between the two indices of this mineral. We can see the pleochroism as before. Now we close the condenser iris. The relief becomes much stronger and Becky lines can be seen round the edges of the grains. When the prism edge is east-west, the light is vibrating parallel with the prism axis of the crystal. The Becky line is now very distinct. It moves inward as the objective is lowered. The index of the crystal is therefore lower than that of the mounting medium. Next, we turn the stage through 90 degrees. Now the light is vibrating at right angles to the prism. There is again a Becky line, and it now moves outward as the objective is lowered. This time, the index of the crystal is higher than that of the mounting medium. Thus, we have proved that tourmaline has different refractive indices for the two principal vibration directions. One is higher than that of the medium, the other is lower. We will now consider the use of the analyzer. When we insert it, the field becomes dark. On turning the polarizer, the field brightens. But it is usual to keep it at right angles. Many objects give brilliant effects when examined in this way. Here are our five cleavage fragments of glass, galena, gypsum, kyanite and calcite. On inserting the analyzer, the field becomes dark. So do the pieces of glass and galena. The calcite, gypsum and kyanite, however, are brightly illuminated. By slightly uncrossing the polarizer, the dark grains can be located. If we rotate the stage, the glass and galena remain dark, but the others alternately brighten and fade. Each passes through four positions of complete darkness in one complete rotation. These are called the extinction positions. One. Two, three, four. This is, in fact, a very sensitive test for distinguishing between the two great classes of transparent materials, which we've already recognized by means of the Becky line. Glass is isotropic. It transmits a polarized beam without altering its vibration direction. Consequently, it is always extinguished by the analyzer. Gypsum is anisotropic. 
we have already seen that in such crystals a polarized beam is resolved into two beams vibrating along principal directions at right angles. We also saw that only when one of these directions coincides with the vibration of the light coming from the polarizer will all the light continue to travel through the crystal without changing its vibration direction. Then it's extinguished by the analyzer. At extinction, therefore, the two principal directions must coincide with the cross lines. Examination between crossed polars is a very sensitive test for birefringence. We have already seen that tourmaline is anisotropic. It is evidently birefringent. It gives extinction when the prism is parallel with the cross lines. This is called straight extinction and often indicates a high degree of crystal symmetry. Less symmetrical crystals may show oblique extinction. In this case, the crystal edge is inclined to the cross lines. By means of the graduated stage, it is possible to measure the angle between the extinction position and some edge or other direction in the crystal. This is called the extinction angle. Even when the crystal has no external face, the extinction can be measured from cleavage cracks. Here is a thin section of Tyree marble with biotite, and horn blend. They are in parallel growth with parallel cleavage. Both are pleochroic. But the biotite has straight extinction, while the horn blend has an oblique extinction of about 20 degrees. Why does the crystal appear bright when the principal directions are not at extinction? We have seen that the original vibration, OP, travels in the crystal as two beams with different velocities, their amplitudes being OH1 and OH2. Each of these beams can in its turn be resolved into components. Those parallel with OP are extinguished by the analyzer and do not interest us further. The other components are parallel with OA. They are OA1 and OA2 and are transmitted by the analyzer. It's very important to note that they're equal and on opposite sides of the center O. Here is the surface of a crystal. If the velocities of the two beams passing through the crystal were alike, OA1 would at any moment be equal to OA2, and the two beams on leaving the crystal would simply neutralize one another, leaving zero amplitude. The crystal would then appear dark. If the crystal is anisotropic, the two velocities are different, and on leaving the crystal, one beam has been retarded in comparison with the other. The crests of the waves are no longer opposite, and the sum of the two is a wave which is transmitted by the analyzer. Consequently, the crystal appears bright. The distance separating the crests of the two waves is called the path difference, or retardation. Evidently, the resulting wave is strongest when the two crests coincide. This happens when the retardation is one-half wavelength. For a complete wavelength retardation, the crests are again opposite and no light reaches the eye. Beyond this value, the extinction recurs at every additional complete wavelength. The difference between the two refractive indices is called the bidifringence. The retardation produced by a crystal section is proportional to the bidifringence and the thickness. The retardation can be measured by means of an effect called compensation. Here is a crystal of thickness 2T, which has caused a retardation of R between the two vibrations in light passing through it. Now suppose this crystal is divided into two layers, each of thickness T. The total retardation is still R. One half of the retardation is due to the lower layer, the other half to the upper layer. In this way, the upper layer is said to reinforce the lower, because the vibration direction of higher index is still pointing the same way in both. Now suppose we rotate the upper layer in its own plane through 90 degrees. Its direction of low index will now coincide with the direction of high index in the lower layer. 
The lower layer causes a retardation of a half hour as before. The upper layer, however, is now retarding the vibration that was advanced in the lower layer. Instead of reinforcing it, it is said to be compensating the lower layer. The two layers are equal, therefore the result is that the emerging vibrations have zero retardation, just as the light had passed through an isotropic substance. Let us look at these effects as they are produced by a thin layer of mica between crossed polars. We superimpose two pieces, one above the other. The upper layer reinforces the effect of the lower, making the double layer brighter. Now we turn the upper layer through 90 degrees in its own plane. This brings it to the compensating position. The overlapping area is now completely dark, one layer having exactly compensated the effect of the other. Here is a wedge built up like a staircase from parallel strips of birefringent material. When seen from above, the successive steps contain one, two, three, and so on, thicknesses of the birefringent material. They reinforce one another to form a wedge in which the steps give increasing amounts of retardation. Between crossed polars, we can see that the edges of this wedge have been cut nearly parallel with the extinction direction. On turning to the 45 degree position, the steps are clearly seen. The retardation of each layer is a very small fraction of a wavelength, and the brightness increases with the thickness. By means of this wedge, we can measure the retardation of a crystal section. Here is a very thin flake of mica. It is birefringent and gives good extinction. We first adjust it to the 45 degree position. We now insert above it the stepped wedge, also at the 45 degree position. The only result is to make the steps brighter. The mica is reinforcing the retardation due to the wedge. We therefore turn the mica through 90 degrees to reach the other 45 degree position, where darkening of some of the steps indicates that compensation is now occurring. The original stepped wedge, due to Fedorov, had steps equal to one quarter wavelength. Stepped wedges have now been superseded by smooth wedges of quartz mounted in glass. They're inserted in a slotted eyepiece or in the tube. Quartz forms hexagonal crystals. When viewed through the sides, they're birefringent, with vibration directions parallel and perpendicular to the axis. In quartz, the vibration parallel with the axis has the higher refractive index. It can also happen that the vibration parallel with the axis has the lower index, as in the mineral calcite. Crystals like quartz are called positive, those like calcite are called negative. In any crystal plate, the vibration direction with the higher index is called the positive or slow direction. Quartz wedges are usually cut parallel to the crystal axis. Their length is therefore the positive direction. The corresponding direction in a crystal which reinforces the quartz wedge is also positive. Quartz wedges are very shallow and thin. Their retardation at the thinnest end is about one quarter wave and it increases uniformly to about six wavelengths at the thick end. When a quartz wedge is compensating a crystal at the 45 degree position, the exact thickness which gives complete compensation is marked by a dark band. The position of this compensation band can be read on a scale engraved along the wedge. The values for the retardation along this scale can be found by reading the wedge itself in monochromatic light. As the thickness of quartz increases, 
the brightness at first increases. But just as in the stepped wedge, each full wavelength of retardation is marked by a black band. Again, if we turn the polarizer to the parallel position, another set of black bands is seen. This time, they mark retardations equal to half a wavelength, and then one and a half, two and a half, and so on. If we know the wavelength of the light, the values for all these bands can be expressed in fractions of a millimeter, using the scale engraved on the wedge. It has been expedient to confine ourselves to the use of monochromatic light. In practice, however, the sense of color may be an invaluable aid to correct identification. And it's proposed at a later date to augment this film with a colored supplement.